Hello and welcome to another episode of I Have Too Much Gear and I Need to Talk About It. So today I'm looking at all of my portable sequencers. Uh, portable I'm defining as just that it can be powered by a battery and it easily fits into a backpack or small bag like that. All of these things uh, fit that category. I'm not going to talk about all of these in one video. I think that might be a bit much. I've already made a uh, kind of full video of my thoughts on the sequencer within the black box, a sequencer in song mode. Uh, so I'm going to kind of skip over that one. And I've made tons of videos about the, uh, the model samples, uh, which I've been, that's just kind of been my go-to for years. Uh, definitely love this one. The SQ64 just got pretty recently. Um, so I'm still kind of learning it. And it's also different from the rest of these in that it's purely a sequencer. It doesn't have any sort of internal uh, sound you know, modules or synthesis or samples or anything like that. So this is kind of in a different category. It has to be plugged into something else to do anything really. So uh, this one's purely a sequencer. But the rest of these are all in that kind of groove box category where um, you know it's a self-contained unit that has its own internal sound generation capabilities with a wonderful sequencer attached. Now, these are the two I want to focus on here. The Polyan Tracker Mini, I just got, I've had it less than a week, and um, this is, you know, kind of my first, not only my first time using a Polyan product, but my first time using a tracker, period. So I'm brand new to this whole kind of workflow. Um, the Electron, you know, sequencer and ecosystem I've been imbued in for a couple of years now, and I know it pretty well. And the, the Electron sequencer really is sort of a version of a tracker. It's like if you have a tracker that you, um, it's kind of a tracker on the back end, but then the front end interface is more like the XOX style sequencer, like, like what you'd find in the, the Roland, like the vintage ones, like the 808 or the more modern, like TR, uh, TR-8S, that type of thing. So it's more similar to that in terms of the interface that you use. So I, I would say that it's, it's like the power of a tracker, but having more of a hands-on and kind of visual feedback type system. So, um, Basically, what I wanted to talk about is just kind of some, you know, since I'm still in this first impression stage with the Tracker Mini here and trackers in general, I've, I've already noticed um, some pretty strong correlations with the Electron Sequencer and some kind of pros and cons. And um, so I just wanted to talk a bit about like, you know, what it's like coming from the Electron Sequencer, trying to learn how to use a tracker and seeing the things that I think maybe the tracker does a little bit better and things that it does a little bit worse. And, you know, if, if you're thinking about getting one of these, maybe uh, that would be helpful. Now, the more fair comparison here would be the Digitact and the Tracker Mini. Uh, both of those are, um, you know, sample based. And uh, I don't have a Digitact though. The Syntact here has the uh, pretty much identical sequencer as to what's in the Digitact. So I still understand that aspect of it. Just note that this one is a synthesizer. This one's a sampler which can do sample-based synthesis, such as wavetable and granular and wave cycle. These two also are purely sample-based and can do similar types of synthesis. This has a granular engine, and it can also do some amounts of like wavetable and wave cycle, and then likewise this as well. Uh, no granular on this one, but I've put out a couple of videos in the past about how you can kind of get granular type sounds out of it and wavetable type sounds out of it and stuff like that. So all of them have some some sort of synthesis capability. Um, but in general, you know, anything sample based, you're gonna have to load samples in there. And if you're working with, uh, you know, samples that don't sound very good, you're probably not gonna have as much fun with it. Uh, this Right now I'm just working with the samples that came with this. So I bought this one used, so I'm not really sure if the samples I'm working with are, you know, just the factory ones, or there might be some that the previous owner put in there. Um, but so far I'm, I like what I hear in this and it's got, you know, good selection of uh, it's got some wavetables that it comes with, you know, various there's like samples from Mars kits. There's a bunch of different stuff. So happy with the sample selection. It is all uh, loaded with a micro SD card, which is great. And so probably what I'll do after some point uh, is take all my samples off the black box micro SD and then load them on onto this one as well. So I have kind of the same the same set of sounds to work with on both. Uh, the other super nice thing here is this one. It's the only one of this whole set that has a USB-C jack. Uh, which is both power, MIDI, and I believe audio over USB does all three. So that's amazing. Um, of course, this one also is the only one with a built-in battery, which is amazing. Um, you know, the only cable you're going to have to have connected is some sort of line out going to headphones or speakers or whatever you're plugged into. So you will have to have a single cable. Um, there is no built-in speaker on this. 
but other than that, it's fully self-contained. Um, that's definitely pretty nice. Now you can see with my black box, I tried to make it self-contained. I strapped a battery on the back of it, um, and then you know it'll it'll run itself like this, and eh, it's okay. <laughs> it's not that great. I would say like using it like this with the two thumbs Game Boy style, it's not bad. It actually like you can easily reach everything and it it, it works. Um, but you know obviously this is pretty awkward having these cables sticking out and like you're still also going to have a cable coming out for headphones or whatever speakers or whatever. So you know it's not ideal. Um, the Tencent Music did just release this kind of backpack battery pack for the Nanobox series, and I'm really hoping they make a version of that for the Black Box and Blue Box as well. Um, hopefully they can do better than what I've done here. So I will say this one can be used this way in this kind of Game Boy style, um, but it, it leaves you wanting a little bit more. I think it's, you know, it's okay, but it's not the best. Now with the Syntact, it's actually fairly hard to power it with the battery. You have to have a battery capable of USB-C PD, and you have to have a bird cord, or also MyVolt just came out with a new product that will run it. Um, and that's, it can be a bit expensive. Um, this is a pretty cheap battery, it's only 20 bucks. But normally I use this much beefier battery with the Syntact, it was like $60, and then the cable's another 20 or 30. So you might be adding upwards of $100 uh, to the value of the Syntact just for the battery and the cable. It's pretty expensive, really. Um, with the Digitact, you can get away with a bit of a cheaper setup because it doesn't have to be USB-C PD, but even still you're going to be adding at least $30 or so um, if you were powering the Digitact from the battery. There, it is also possible to mod the Digitact and Digitone to have an internal battery, which is pretty cool. Um, but of course if you're paying someone else to do that mod, I don't know what it costs, but probably more than $100, right? So, um, you know, that's it's a consideration for the portability thing. Uh, definitely, you know, this one takes the cake in terms of portability. This one also comes with a really nice carrying case. Let me grab that here. This is the case for it, um, which, I mean, it's great. My only minor gripe is I wish it had a little pouch on the back for your, like, earbuds or extra cables or something. You know, this only stores the device itself. But still, I mean, it's, it's really good quality and nice. Um, whereas with all these other devices, you know, I had to buy cases separately, which are an extra... 30 or 50 bucks or whatever. So um, really, if you kind of factor in the cost of the, the built-in battery and the case it comes with, um, the price on the Polyen Tracker Mini is looking better and better. Um, it's now on the used market. It's now in the $600 range. I've seen it sometimes in the $500 to $600 range, um, whereas the new price on this one is $700. Uh, I bought the Syntact at launch price of $1,000, uh, which was probably not the best call, and they're, they're now going for more like 800 maybe even a bit less on the used market. Uh, Digitact, I think, is, I think it's in the 500 to 550 range used, so that one's a pretty good deal. Black box, similar, 500 to 550, something like that. Um, but anyway, just if you think about kind of all the other accessories you have to get alongside these other ones, uh, the Tracker Mini price, you know, especially $600-ish used, is actually more or less the same as the rest of these. It's pretty darn close. So that's, you know, that's, that's uh, worth considering. Um, now I got this one in trade. I actually traded my Digitone for it. And that's uh, simply because I also have the Digitone keys and I prefer that version of it. And so the Digitone was kind of redundant in my setup. And in terms of this form factor, I really enjoy this intact and I have been just using it more. So for me, this was, this was a great trade and the, uh, Digitone also is in that kind of $600-ish used uh, range. Anyway, uh, let's start talking about the actual sequencers. So what I want to focus on here is um, the, you know, the idea that all of these give you a way of having a portable sequencer with built-in sounds, which you can use either as a music sketch pad or as a way of just writing your full songs to music. Um, there's quite a few people who've written entire albums on just a single one of these boxes. And um, it's, it's easily, easily possible with any one of them. So um, what I immediately notice about this one, obviously the sequencer looks different, right? It's got this vertical orientation. In the settings, there's a way to make it go horizontal as well, um, if that's your preference. But you've got four, or sorry, eight tracks here. Each one is monophonic so it's similar to like the model samples in that sense where here you've got six tracks each one is monophonic 
Um, same here. Now the, the tracker does have kind of a more clever way of doing polyphony, like if you have an external keyboard or something attached to it and you play a chord, it will write each note of that chord into adjacent tracks. So if I played like a four note chord, it would take up four or half of the tracks that are in here, which is definitely better than what this one does. The model sample simply just doesn't allow you to do it. It'll just record one note of that chord. So um, definitely that's nice. It's basically, it's capable of up to eight note polyphony, but if you play eight notes of polyphony, you're going to be using up every single track. You can't make any other sound besides that one big chord. So it's not really ideal for chords. Now, of course, since it's sample based, you can also just always just play a sample of a chord. Um, any of these, you know, can do that. So uh, that, uh, you know, again, worth, worth considering if you're thinking if, if polyphony is really important to you, um, this is, it, it has kind of a workaround, but I wouldn't say that's its forte. Now, the other biggest thing I noticed with this right away is that there's really no way of doing live recording on the device itself. You have to just sequence everything in, like program everything in. Now, with, an, with a MIDI controller attached, a keyboard, or drum pads, or whatever, from that you can do live recording. And that's going to be similar to how live recording works on the electrons, where you, you know, put it in its recording mode, it's playing the song, and you're playing along with it, and it's recording your MIDI data. So it's capable, but it's just not capable within the device itself. And I think that's the primary downside I'm seeing just right off the bat. Because even something cheap like the model samples has the ability to do live recording from the device. You've got velocity sensitive pads, and then you've got non-velocity sensitive uh, kind of button keyboard down here. Either way, you can play little melodic lines or you can tap in your rhythms um, pretty easily. So here it's, it's very different. And if uh, that ability to live record is, you know, kind of critical to how you work, well, then you're going to have to have a MIDI controller to go with it. And, you know, it could be something small, like, like my NPX8 here I use a lot. It's just a way of adding drum pads to something. This one will work fine. Um, it's going to have to be one that has TRS MIDI out, though. Um, and I would need an adapter, because this is TRS Type A, this is Type B. So you're going to have to have an adapter for that. Um, but uh, there's no USB in on this. Um, like, so, for example, the black box has this USB device port, where I can plug a MIDI controller into that, and it will power the MIDI controller and talk to it. So basically you can be a lot more kind of self-contained because of that. Whereas to my knowledge, you know, even though this has this nice USB-C port that does not do USB device host, uh, at least I don't think so. Let me just double check. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but yeah, here we go. So I've got the MIDI controller attached with the USB-C adapter and you see it's not even powering on. It's not doing anything. So that does not work. So from my perspective, that hurts the portability of this. Like it's going to make it less portable um, because you can't do that kind of on the fly jamming live input type of thing. Uh, but, you know, again, that's just kind of part of the tracker thing, I guess. Uh, whereas the, the electrons, whichever version of that you get, they do allow you to do both. Even the black box lets you do it um, through its touchscreen, which is definitely not ideal, but you know, it's better than nothing. Um, you can even play chords. It's a multi-touch screen. So you can even play chords on this one. So all of the other ones have some way of live recording from the device itself. Of all these ones here, I would say it's kind of a toss up for me between these two. I really like the buttons on here, but they're not velocity sensitive, whereas the pads on here are velocity sensitive. So I don't know, I, I like both. Um, but uh, yeah, either one of these is my preference for, for that type of thing. Okay. Uh, the next thing I noticed right off the bat is that for each step in your sequence here, uh, you have up to two effects parameters that you can assign to that step. That is basically the same as in the electron sequencer. Um, however, in the electron sequencer, you can assign way more than two parameters per step. Um, in fact, I don't know if there is an upper limit. So like, let's say I was in here, so I was adding this step going in here. What you do is you just turn all these knobs whatever you want and when it highlights in white like that it's now they call it p lock or parameter lock it's now locked those parameters to that step so that's eight on this page now i switch to the filter page and do the same thing here's another eight so now we're up to 16 all right and then you know you can just keep going so like i honestly don't know if there is an upper limit on this um but it's way more than two for sure 
So in terms of kind of the depth of what you can change uh, parameters per step, the electron sequencer goes way, way deeper. Now the model series is more basic in that sense. Um, you can still p-lock stuff, um, but it's, you know, it's just what's on these knobs here. There's not like deeper menus and levels and stuff. Uh, whereas the Digiboxes, Digitax, Syntax, Digitone, they all have so many deeper menus you can get into um, to parameter lock even more stuff. So I would say the electron sequencer is, is a lot deeper in that sense. You can do more per step and have things you know, change kind of throughout your song. Um, now the, the one here, you know, also the, the kind of general format of it is a little bit weird to me. Again, this is just kind of the tracker thing of like packing a ton of information into one screen. So like um, each of the each of the parameters you can change. Like let's go in here the blank one. You have this whole list of them, which I'm sure you can't read, but um, I don't know how many things are on this list. Probably 40-ish things on this list that you can change, and each one of them gets a corresponding letter from the alphabet, um, lowercase or uppercase. And it, uh, you have to just kind of memorize what that is. And so some of them are pretty logical, like V is volume. You can also call it velocity. It's the same thing, right? Um, some of them are not so much like letter I is swing. You know, why didn't they use the letter S? Well, because letter S is used for slice, you know? So there's things like that um, where I'm sure you'll get used to it after a while, but at least when you first use it, you know, I frankly don't know what any of the letters mean and I have to look at this menu every time. Uh, that probably becomes quicker later on. But um, it is nice though that you can see kind of in one view a bunch of different parameter changes over time. Um, whereas here you kind of can't, you know, like if I go to, let's say, uh, track two, okay, so I've got more stuff going on here. So each one of these red ones is a you know a note value and if I had any p-locks on them they would be here and then this is what they call a trigless trig which basically means it's doing something it looks like I'm uh, I've p-locked the delay send on this one but it's not triggering a note um, you can do the same thing here where you can have uh, effects changes parameter changes without triggering a note so it has that same functionality which is great to see again the difference being that here you're limited to two effects changes per step here it's like I don't know, 50 or something. So uh, definitely uh, a lot, a lot more potential to get crazy with this one. So, um, but the the upside of this this kind of interface is that just at a glance, I can see that stuff is happening, even if I don't remember what that letter means. You know, all I have to do is hold this and find the letter in the list. I'm like, oh yeah, it's that. Okay. Um, but on here, I can see that something's happening but I really don't know what parameter I've locked until I go through and I dig through all these menus and find, oh yeah, so there's something else too. I also p-locked the LFO trig and the filter trig on and off. You know, so you have to like, you have to basically go through all these menus and figure out, okay, what is it that I actually did here if you don't have it, you know, if you don't remember. There's kind of no other visual indication um, here. So in that sense, in the kind of visual sense of seeing what's happening throughout the course of your song, Tracker makes a lot of sense for that, and it's it, it's quite good. So yeah, um, I'm liking that part. I also like that it goes up to 128 steps. This one is a max of 64 steps. All the electrons are max of 64 steps. And in order to get 128 steps, you have to reduce the step resolution. Um, and you can go longer than that too. Um, which is, you know, generally not a big deal, but in some cases could be a big deal. Whereas this one just gives you 128 out of the gate, which is great. Okay, um, now I also want to talk about the copy-paste functionality because in the electron sequencer, the ability to copy-paste is really like critical in terms of you know speeding up the workflow and also making things consistent. Like if I you know have a single sound and I've put a lot of time into doing a bunch of parameter locks and all this stuff um, on onto that one step, I don't want to have to do that over and over. So I just copy that step and paste, paste, paste. So that's really fast. And then you can also copy and paste entire patterns. You can copy um, pages of parameters. You can copy uh, pages of trigs. Uh, and there's all kinds of things you can copy and paste here. So like 
it works really well. You do have to kind of memorize the shortcuts. It's not always um, it's not always obvious how you're supposed to copy and paste something, but once you learn them, then it's really fast and works really well. Now here it seems simpler because you just have a copy button, and then when you want to paste it, you hold Shift and that and copy again is paste. But notice how nothing happened. Um, this is it for me at least. It's a little bit confusing. You have to be on the highlighted on the right thing. Basically, I was on this FX2 um, lane, and there's nothing there. So when I copied it, it didn't copy the whole step. If you want to copy the whole step, you have to be on, I think you have to be on note. Let me see, I copy this, paste. No, why didn't it paste? Copy. Yeah, I don't understand, okay. Maybe I need to be on instrument. Copy, paste. Oh, because I'm not in rec mode, that's why. Here we go. So now, let's see if it lets me copy from the empty one. Copy. Paste. Yep, it did. Okay. So you have to remember to be in this rec mode. Uh, recording mode is really editing mode. It's just like, are you allowed to edit this edit steps or not? So if it's in green, you're kind of looking at things, but you can't do anything. And then if it's red, it lets you do things. Um, and I find that a little confusing. Um, I just, just like I showed, it's, it's not obvious to me, like why you should have to be in this other mode just to copy and paste the step, but you know, that's how it works. So uh, let's go back here. Let's delete that step I made. Um, the other thing is that I I was really excited about the ability to do this, to hold shift, highlight a bunch of stuff, all right, and now hit copy. And now let's say I go to a totally different pattern. There's like a blank pattern. Come up here, go to the top, and paste. There we go. So I just copied this whole section of the song from one pattern to another. That's really cool. And the closest analogy to that on the Electron one would be copying a page of trigs and then moving it over. Um, but the thing is, with the tracker, each step contains not only the note value and your FX values, but also contains which instrument you're playing, which basically means an instrument is basically a sample, but it can get more complicated than that. So like. For example, if you have a sample and you have applied a bunch of stuff to it, you know, filters and you've changed the length and the gate and all this kind of stuff, uh, that all gets baked into the instrument. So that one yellow number there, um, it actually contains a lot of data, more than just this is the particular sample you're going to play. So in order to, um, when you do that here with Electron, you can copy the trigs um, and it's going to remember all the things assigned to that trig but it's not necessarily going to remember, uh, you know, the, the particular sample or the particular synth engine or whatever, because those things, basically like the MIDI, the MIDI side of this is kind of divorced from the, um, the audio side, at least on the Syntac and the Digitone. I've never used the Digitac, so I don't know if it's exactly the same, but it, I think it probably is. So in terms of being able to like, just copy a section of your song, this is way better. Um, I really like that ability to just, you know, highlight stuff and copy it and move it. Um, and it also has this, uh, it has a couple shortcuts, I'm still learning them, but you hold shift and press insert, jumps you to the top, which is nice. There's some shortcut I haven't figured out yet. It's supposed to let you like highlight an entire row. I want to figure that one out. <laughs> um, anyway, so in terms of kind of moving stuff around, kind of managing trigs in this pretty visual way, um, managing steps or trigs, whatever you want to call them, I think this is this is pretty good, and I can definitely see the appeal of it. It's like you have to kind of read the hieroglyphics and like understand what it means, but um, you know that just comes with time and and experience and muscle memory. So I'm I'm sure I'll get there, and I think maybe would eventually. So that I'm that part of it is quite good. The other thing I want to talk about is the fill mode on here, um, and the fill mode is sort of a corollary to. The, the trig conditions here. So here, if I put down a trig, I have all of these conditions that I can add to that trig. Um, you can add a percentage, you can add um, various types of uh, conditional logic, which basically means if it's conditionals are basically if then statements. So if this happens, then this other thing will happen. So for example, I could tell this trig uh, to only fire if the previous trig fired. Uh, and then I could set the previous trig to be on a probability or something like that. 
And then you can also have all these other ones, like first is really useful, like if you have a really long sample, like say it's a, a really long sound a drone or something, you want it to trigger once and then never again. That's what first does, uh, so that one's really useful. Or not first is the opposite, where I want it to not trigger the first time, the first playthrough, and then uh, it should trigger every other time. So these conditionals are super useful, and they really like, this is kind of the whole secret sauce of the Electron Workstation is these conditionals. Um, you can uh, you know you you can make your patterns sound longer than they are by having um, trigs only happen every say you know fourth bar or something like that. So there's a lot of cool things you can do with trigs uh, trig conditions in here, and I find it super interesting. And you can use it to make actual generative music. And what I mean by that is it's not just randomly picking probability of whether you hear a sound or not. It's actually making these logical chains of like, if you heard the kick drum, then you should also hear the snare. But if the kick drum gets muted, then you should also mute the snare. Um, or things like, you know, if, if you're hearing the closed hat, then you should not be able to hear the open hat. Or anytime you hear the open hat, the closed hat should choke it or gate it, you know, make it stop ringing out. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do like that to make these, these generative patterns, both rhythmic patterns and melodic patterns which will uh, never repeat, or at least take you know, many years to repeat themselves. So that's what I consider to be like truly generative music, where I'm putting in a kind of a, a set of parameters, or you could call them algorithms, I guess, um, uh, that the sequencer has to work within. It's a set of rules that it has to follow. But then there's all these different kind of paths that it can take. You can think of like a, a branching tree, you know, where it starts here, and then there's a decision point and it branches. There's two options. And then from each option, there's two more options and two more and two more. And so it just branches out. And so you can hit play. You know where you're going to start, but you do not know where you're going to end up. And I just think that's really, really fun. Even the model uh, series, the cheapest ones, can do that. Um, so there's a lot of potential for uh, really interesting generative music creation with these. Now, with the tracker made, and um, from what I've seen, this applies to the, the main tracker, the OG tracker as well. Um, it's not quite as advanced in that sense. So the way fill works is, well, first of all, you have to choose your, the range of your fill, which again, this is nice, right? I could, I could select a bunch of different stuff like this, choose fill, and now I have to tell it, okay, what are you filling? Do I want it to add note values? Do I want it to add effects values? Whatever. Um, and there's the Euclidean sequencer, which is generative, but it's kind of, um, I don't know, it's, it's not pure random, but basically what, what you tell it is within this section that I've highlighted, uh, how many events do you want to happen? So for example, let's say I want 11 events to happen. We're going to add note values. This is a bit of a counterintuitive thing, but if I wanted to add note values to empty steps, I have to pick no note, meaning I want to write into all the steps that do not currently have a note value. So that there's that. Um, and then I want it to do a random note value um, oh, hold on. I'm, I have my instrument selected right now. So I'm going to do, let's say a random instrument from these. All right. So starting here, ending here, so it's just going to be a bunch of random, like drum sounds and let's do that. Okay. And now with all that still highlighted, I can hit fill again. And now, now I want to say, okay, this time I want you to, uh, change the note value. Okay, so this is created, it's, it's generative in the sense that it has generated all of these notes, these note values, as well as the sample or the instrument that those notes are triggering. Uh, you could likewise do the same thing of having it generate a bunch of different, um, different effects values. But it's not generative in the sense that it's going to change every time it plays, right? This is going to be the exact same pattern every time it loops around. Whereas on the electron sequencers, you can make these patterns that are completely different every time it loops around. And that I think is just really interesting. As far as I know, you can't do that on the tracker, or at least I haven't figured out a way to do that. Um, but again, I'm brand new with this. So maybe there's a way I just haven't figured out yet. Okay. Um, the song mode on both of these is honestly almost identical. Um, I don't know if there's a lot to compare here. They both have song mode. They're both very similar. 
Um, I would say the electron song mode is a little bit better. Um, how do I get into it? I always forget how. I forgot edit. Okay. Um, let's see. Push it down. Let's add a bunch of stuff to our song. It's a little bit better in the sense that I can tell it not only what pattern to play, but also how many times to loop that pattern, um, and also the length and the change length. So, and you can even have your BPM change per section of the song, which is cool. So you definitely get more parameters in the song mode here. This one is a lot more basic where you just tell it, you know, in slot one, you're gonna play pattern two, in slot two, you're gonna play pattern eight, you know, that kind of thing. If you want it to repeat a certain pattern multiple times, you have to just take up multiple slots for that. And then also, there doesn't seem to be an option, or at least I haven't found a way to, to tell it to play through the song once and then stop. Uh, whereas that is an option here. In this one, it plays through the song and then it loops back to the beginning and it just does that endlessly. So you would have to stop it manually. So um, that could be a consideration if you're using this as like a backing track or something to play on. It is going to loop back to the beginning again unless you manually press, you know, the, well, the play button is your play, pause, stop. It's all of those things in one, which again, I don't really like. I like, it. I like them all being separate like here. Um, because pause and stop are different functions. Um, with the electron sequencer, you have, uh, you know, you, you have different functions. Pause means it pauses wherever you are in the sequence, and then it resumes from that, that spot. Uh, whereas stop means it takes you back to the beginning. Here, you only have stop. Every time you press this button, it completely stops, and you're going to start over at step one again. There's no way that I've found to pause in the middle. Um, unless, I wonder if, shh, if play does it. Let me just try. Okay, I stand corrected. I figured it out. <laughs> so if you hold shift and press play, then it does give you that pause functionality where it stops in the middle and resumes. So, okay, that's cool. Or I guess what it does actually is it, it starts you from wherever you're... Uh, I think what it's doing is it's starting you from wherever this cursor is, wherever one you have selected. So it's it's not quite the same. Um, the whole like, the whole concept of like a cursor or a specific step being selected doesn't really exist in the electron workflow. So there's kind of no corollary for that. But anyway, at least there's a way to do it. Um, so in my mind, there's not really a clear winner here. It's just kind of different flavors. Um, I think that I'm I'm really interested in this tracker workflow to kind of see where it goes. Like. When I first looked into these years ago, I kind of convinced myself, ah, this isn't for me. Um, but now that I actually have one in my hands and I'm using it, I can see it is pretty darn fun. And uh, certainly, you know, the portability music making on the go with this is pretty unbeatable. What I think is interesting about sequencers in general is that the decision making process that they kind of force you to go through is going to change the outcome of your music. And I'm already seeing that the tracker is ideal for the type of IDM music that I like to make. Um, you know, whereas the Electron is also pretty ideal for IDM music, but I'm also, you know, it's also pretty easy to make other styles and genres with it. Whereas, I, I don't know, I'm still kind of, I want to keep an open mind about it. And I've seen people making hip hop and stuff like that on the tracker, so I know it's possible, um, but it doesn't seem like as intuitive to me or as conducive. Um, you know, with an external MIDI controller, it probably gets a lot easier. Another thing I'm thinking about though is like, okay, if I have an external MIDI controller attached, I'm gonna want this thing like on an angled stand and then all your cables are on the bottom. So it's gonna be kind of hard to put this thing on a stand, you know, with the keyboard underneath it. So I don't know, that's <laughs> something I'm thinking about. Um, definitely the built-in mic on this is really cool though. And I haven't played with it much yet, but I'm really excited uh, to use the built-in mic on this and like use found sounds. I always had that kind of vision with the black box that I was going to go around, I was going to use my field recorder here, record a bunch of sounds, load them in here, do a bunch of found sound stuff. I never actually did it because it's just kind of too much of a pain. Um, you can also just plug a mic directly into this as long as it outputs line level. Um, so for example, the lapel mic I used to make these videos has this little um, inline battery pack where basically it's got a little preamp and little batteries in here. And so this boosts the mic output to line level. Um, so you could plug that into the black box or anything like this is a little $20 mic, you know, it's definitely possible to give the black box a cheap mic. 
Um, but you know, like I said, the whole the whole system with cables and stuff running everywhere is not going to be anywhere near as slick and unified as the Tracker Mini. So I really appreciate the built-in mic. Um, I do. I I miss a built-in speaker though. Honestly, I know most people don't like built-in speakers, and none of the rest of these have built-in speakers either. But I've got a bunch of other stuff that does. And considering that the Tracker uh, in general kind of came out of like chiptune music or maybe the other way around chiptune music came out of the tracker um you, you don't need a good speaker for chiptune music in fact the whole point is that it was music designed for terrible little pc speakers that like really could just make little beeps <laughs> you know and um so it's like the the speakers that get built into things now i think in my opinion the tracker mini could have had a very low quality speaker um and that totally would have worked with the vibe of it because a ton of people are going to be making chiptune style music with this and that little speaker is what you need for that you know so i really appreciate when something can be fully wireless you know like just used the only devices i really have like that uh the pocket operators uh the volcas and then my reface dx all of those i i sometimes use just with the built-in speaker and like yeah it's not great quality but it's just so nice to not have any cables or have to have headphones or whatever i really appreciate it you know, I wouldn't record my music through that speaker, um, but for just messing around and, you know, sketching and songwriting, it's it's really worthwhile. So in my opinion, uh, this should have a little speaker. Fortunately, it does not. Okay, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, I will share some more in-depth thoughts on this once I get more used to it and learn more about it. Um, hopefully this little, like, cursory overview is kind of useful. Um, I think uh, I'm just enjoying this process of exploring different sequencers and seeing what I get out of them. I still think the Electron one is like the one that speaks to me the most. Uh, but you know, I've gotten some stuff out of the SQ64 that I can't do on an Electron box. And I think I'm going to have the same experience here with the tracker. Uh, so I'll let you know how it goes. Cheers.